that please do a little saving because remember what you earn, a portion of it belongs to you also because the rest of it goes to government. So ladies and gentlemen, I wouldn't tire the people with the, with the, the, the prosaic things. They like more lively things from Mr. Parshivala who will castigate the government right and left and they will be quite happy. I am very happy to be with you here today and as I said, I shall not be speaking again. Thank you. I now call upon Mr. Palkiwala to give his address. The chairman, Mr. Justice Sirayatullah, his, the Honorable Sheriff, Mr. Nana Sama, Mr. Apche, Mr. Pai, Mr. Divakara, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very grateful to the previous speakers for their generous, gracious words about me. There is a pleasant custom at annual general meetings of companies, which is a great time saver, that you take the notice calling the meeting as read. And I shall take take it as presumed conclusively that you are familiar with the nuts and bolts of the budget, which you must have read about in the papers. In fact, the papers have left us with no option but to know what the budget contains. So let me come straight to the subject and tell you how I view the <clears throat> this budget in the light of the requirements of this country. First a word about the finance minister. I think he belongs to a rare species in India's political life. He's a man with a well-equipped, well-furnished mind a man of total integrity, total sincerity, great dedication to the good of the country. So I hold him as a human being in the highest esteem and respect, apart from the fact that he has been a, a friend for at least 20 years. And the ends of his budget, which he has set out in the budget speech, are unexceptionable. You can't quarrel with any of the goals which he has set about himself. Apart from the budget speech, when you come to the budget proper, if I have to describe it in a few words, I would say, it is not a budget to make you deliriously happy, nor is it a budget to drive you to the verge of suicidal despair. Some have called it a good budget in bad times, although reserving the view that it would have been a bad budget in good times. But we are going through a period of what can, what can only be described as bad times, as I'll try to show you in a moment. The task of the finance minister has been most unenviable because he had to take not his party along with him, but the entire spectrum of economic thinking in the country because the government can survive only with the support of BJP on the one side and the communists on the other side. Therefore, it is the totality of economic thinking in the subject which had to be looked at before he could frame a policy which can be said to be the policy underlying the budget. So you should not be very much surprised if there are some conflicting signals emitted by the budget. A few words as to what are the bad times in which, against the backdrop of which this budget has to be considered. To my mind, the the darkest shadow 
over the economy of this country, I would describe as the national debt. The national debt not in the literal narrow sense in which it is used in different official documents, but the national debt in the sense of the totality of the indebtedness of the government of India, which has to be made good at some time or other. It means not merely the government securities and bonds, but for example the small savings which are all deposited with the government, which have come from the people, the provident fund dues of millions of people in this country, the public provident fund which is again with the government and so forth. I would use the compendious expression the national debt in the sense of the total indebtedness of the government of India. Now today that national debt is 260,000 crores and the interest paid on that national debt is 17,000 crores. It is the largest single slice of central government expenditure, this interest burden. The government has to pay by way of interest more than the total amount it spends either on defense or on planned programs. This is a very dangerous situation. In fact, it is so dangerous that I think it is the duty of every thinking citizen to ensure that he puts an end to this developing mischief before it goes out of control. There is a remedy, Article 292 of the Constitution, which provides that the Parliament may by law prescribe limits up to which debts can be incurred by the government which are to be charged on the Consolidated Fund of India. But I am afraid no such law has yet been passed by Parliament. The Chakravati Committee strongly recommend that such a law should be passed. The Public Accounts Committee in four different reports have suggested very seriously that such a law should be passed. The very first rate, first class controller general whom we have, we are lucky enough to have, made a suggestion last year that such a law should be passed. But up to now, because of public apathy, which is the great problem in our country, such a law has not been passed because, frankly, half the members of parliament would not know what such a law would be all about, and, and the other half are not pressurized by their constituents to pass such a law. Net result, there is still not even a strong public opinion built up, as it ought to be, that there should be such a ceiling or limit on public indebtedness. Now the more dangerous thing is, not that you have the indebtedness of 260,000 crores as the total national debt in the large sense, but this is increasing and even in this budget, this debt will increase by 36,000 crores in the next 12 months. The foreign debt, what is called the external debt, will increase by 3,300 crores. So between the two debts, internal and external, there would be a total increase of th more than 39,500 crores. That works out to 110 crores every single day. So by the time you get up tomorrow morning, the national debt will, will have increased by 110 crores. My own feeling is that the problem is so serious, not serious so much for us as for our children, that there should be a clock put up in every district, in every town and city of India. Let it be at the expense of charities. I am willing to contribute my own might. That clock should be called the Kalyug clock. The Kalyug clock will show the date 
that is today would be said the 23rd March 1990 and it will show the total indebtedness today tomorrow it will show tomorrow's date 24th March and show the indebtedness having risen by 110 crores I will give you an idea of how serious the matter is by comparing our situation with that of the world's most prosperous country, the United States. In the United States, there is a similar clock put up in New York. It is called the Doomsday Clock. And it shows how every second the national debt of the U.S. government increases by 8,000 dollars. If you take it per second here, our national debt increases by more than 11,000 rupees per second. Now on the basis, which is a fair one, that what is the a dollar to the United States is a rupee to India. We are going further than the United States in our compulsive borrowing spree. $8,000 there. 11,000 rupees per second in India. How t it is unimaginable. To me, it's a matter of total surprise how ministers can yet carry on with this kind of activity and yet not think of curtailing governmental expenditure apart from saying that they propose to do it. But the fact that they say it is proposed to be done has been said for the last 40 years. There has never been a year in the last 40 years when the government, the budget speech did not say that they want to contain, to limit the governmental expenditure. But it goes on. You can't blame the finance minister alone because there are other, other ministries who have no sense of self-restraint. It is because there is no sense of, sense of self-restraint that I am suggesting a law to be made by parliament. Now this Kalyu clock would bring home to the people what the gravity of the situation is. It is caused by two factors. One, the revenue account deficit of the government. And secondly, the balance of trade deficit. The revenue account deficit arises from this, that the government lives beyond its own means and beyond your means and mine. <coughs> The, for example, in this budget, by a man so good as Professor Madhu Dandavati, the revenue deficit, that's the deficit on revenue account, is no less than 13,000 crores. It is thought to be reduced to 7,200 by taking 5,800 from the capital account. That means the government will borrow 5,800 to pay for what would be the what would be known to economists as consumption, that is the ordinary consumption, that is the expenditure incurred on revenue account by the government. In other words, we are living on borrowed money year after year after year. It, it did not happen before 7980, but since 7980 it has been continuing and every year it is aggravated with a vengeance. But people are not serious enough, they don't realize what damage you are causing to the national economy. The USA can afford to bear the burden. Can this poor country afford it? The balance of trade deficit I have dealt with. Let me come to the, I'm sorry, the balance of trade deficit let me come to after the revenue account deficit of the government. The balance of trade deficit arises from the fact that we import goods worth 33,000 crores, as we did in this year, and we export goods worth 28,000 crores. So there is a deficit of 5,000 crores. But it's not the deficit of one year. It has been going on year after year after year. If you ask me, is this country capable of exporting more, I think there is not the slightest doubt that it can, provided we follow the right policies. This country, I am never tired of saying, is not poor by nature, but it is poor by policy. You have some of the finest brains in this country, some of the brightest minds. Instead of quoting my own words, let me quote the words of Riley.
Sir William Riley, the Executive Vice Chairman of the International, Monet uh, International Financial Corporation. He said, India has some of the most dynamic entrepreneurs, some of the most creative business leaders, some of the sharpest commercial brains, and yet this country has to remain in this poverty because of the foolish policies we pursue and which we will not give up. In fact, the time has come when we will have to work to make this nation rich against the wishes of our leaders because they don't seem to be interested in enriching this nation. Somehow there is something in our culture which makes us believe that poverty is something glorious and great. The net result that I am quite happy to see my fellow countrymen very poor while I myself live in reasonable comfort. Now, your, our position as, a, as an exporting nation was very high in 1950 when we started as a republic. We were the 16th in the world. Today we are the 43rd. We had 2.2% of the world trade. Today we have 0.43% of the world trade. That is less than half of 1%. The Chancellor of the Exchequer said the other day in the House of Commons, that India is a good example of how not to run the economy of a country. He said, here is Hong Kong, which has only 5 million people, as against our 840 million. That means it has less than 1% of India's population. Its total land area is 0.03% of India's. That is 3 upon 10,000. It's only one city. But its, in, but its international trade is twice the trade of India. Imagine one single port having more international trade than all the ports of India put together, including your Bombay and New Bombay and Madras and Calcutta and the rest. Can you, doesn't it make you wonder whether we are not playing our part in ensuring that the right policies are followed by the government? Because as Abraham Lincoln said, it's without the sentiment of the people, nothing can succeed. It's only when the people are aroused to realize what the rights are and what the right policies ought to be, that the right policies would be adopted. So the greatest problem, the greatest shadow is the national debt caused by this balance of payments deficit and the revenue account deficit. The next is the public sector which, of course, the finance minister for the first time says he will try to dilute in a certain manner, which I'll talk of in a moment. 71,000 crores is invested in the union government public sector enterprises, which number 231, 71,000 crores. If you take the state enterprises, which are 636 in number, 25,000 additional crores are invested there. The net result, the net return to the nation is very small. In fact, in the, among the state enterprises, some of you may not know that even the accounts are not ready for two years. I remember when I was on the Reserve Bank board, we kept on sending reminders to the state electricity boards to submit their accounts. No accounts are submitted. Normally, it's beyond two years that an account comes to you. Today, the state electricity board's accounts are not available for the last two years. So if you are asked what is the return or what is the absence of return on the capital employed, you would have to give the figures more than two years old. Why is this tolerated? How is it that Tata Electric companies make a profit working under restrictions as to what their profit can be? And the state electricity boards, every one of them works at a loss throughout India. Why is it that private operators are working their buses and their trucks at a profit and the Delhi Transport Authority, government-owned, is making a loss of between 100 and 200 crores a loss every year? Is there no accountability? Will the people... One day there will be a revolution in this country. I, when I, I remember when J.P. Jai Prakash Narayan used to talk of a total revolution. I said to myself, but why is the man getting so agitated? 
as I grow older and I come to the end of my life, I tell myself, perhaps Jay Prakash was right. What is the other answer? How will these poor people ever see daylight? If you keep on pursuing policies which are so dead against the interests of the poor man. It's not as if the minister, for example, Professor Dandavate would not care for the poor. He would. He has a heart of gold. But the point is that the, the structure has become so fossilized that it is very, very difficult to change it. You need a drastic change which can only be by a revolutionary leader who can bring about a transformation in our habits of thinking. As, for example, in China they did, or in the Soviet Union they have, in Gorbachev. A first-rate man, but thrown up by almost a revolutionary movement, which has led to Eastern Europe being liberated, as you have just heard from Mr. Apte. The last point I would like to deal with by way of backdrop to the budget is the black market problem. It is true, in fact I don't think there is a man here who would not be against the black market. I am dead against it myself, so please do not misunderstand me if I put to you certain aspects and facts. My simple point is that while the black market ought to be curbed, and every endeavor should be made to curb it, the finance minister has said in his budget speech that he proposes to have a scheme under which you can construct houses for the poor, develop rural areas, construct hospitals, etc., and no questions would be asked as to where you, where you get, got your money from. Other countries have done the same during, after the last world war. Belgium did it, France did it, and a number of other European countries. 